right, guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 189, featuring a full hour with Mr. Swin Vinka, the founder of Larian Studios, the company responsible for the Divinity series. He's on this week to talk about the Divinity Original Sin Kickstarter project. Uh, this thing looks fantastic. It's already pretty far along, but they want to raise $400,000 to really do the game justice, to add in all the little things that add up to a really great game. They've already raised $375,000, and they've got 18 days left to go, so this thing looks very likely to make. thought you guys would like to, to hear from uh, Swin on how this is going, and a little behind-the-scenes look at the whole thing. Really good stuff. If you guys uh, would like to pledge to the Kickstarter, I'll, of course, put the links to that in the show notes. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Swin Vinka. All right, folks, I am here with Swin Vinka. He is the founder of Larian Studios, the uh, studio responsible for the Divinity series. Uh, they've got a lot of awesome games in that series, but the uh, for the most recent one, the upcoming uh, Divinity Original Sin, they've decided to take this to Kickstarter. It looks like a great project, and Swin is here to tell us all about it. So, how are you doing today, Swin? I'm feeling a bit sleepy, Matt, to be honest, uh, but otherwise I'm feeling uh, very fine. Thank you. Looks like, a, is it morning or evening there in Belgium? It, it is afternoon, actually, but it's been, uh, we have very short nights for the moment because of the Kickstarter, and uh, everybody warns you about it, but when you're actually experiencing it, it turns out to be worse than people warn you about, or at least that uh, you've been led to believe. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people here about their Kickstarters, and it seems like the general consensus is it's nice to have the interaction with the fans, but at the same time, a very stressful experience. Are you leaning more towards the, the pleasure or the pain here? I, to be honest, it's where I'm getting my energy from. I mean, this is the, the, the nice part of it. The, uh, the, 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 the hard part is just all the behind-the-scenes stuff, like uh, making sure that press is aware, trying to get attention through new channels, trying to figure out why are we not reaching people that we should be reaching, and that's a lot of work. I mean, there's, a, there's a no, no doubt about that. So, um, And we've been, yeah, we've been very busy. Uh, the interaction with the fans, it's very similar to what we were doing when um, I started out with this company. When we were making Divine Divinity, I used to uh, be programming on the left side and uh, talking in my forums on the right side, something which sadly uh, has gotten a little bit less over the years. Uh, so that feels very much like um, yeah, back in the 90s, I guess. Do you say uh, the Kickstarter is performing as you would expect, or do you feel like you've got some catching up to do, or you're alarmed? Uh, you know, where are you on that scale? Uh, it depends on uh, which moment of the day you would ask me. Uh, I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, obviously, we have Torment to go uh, up against. I mean, that's fantastic, and I'm, I'm happy for them also. Um, we launched maybe prematurely. It's possible. I don't know. Uh, we thought that we had to launch because we lined up about, what was it, 70 or 80 articles with press, and then the first one started to come out in magazines, So, and we weren't ready yet with our Kickstarter campaign. We said, well will have to go because there was Shroud of the Avatar, there was Torment, now there's Camelot, tomorrow there will be Baldur's Gate 3, I don't know. So um, there's always going to be a reason not to do it. So we just said, okay, let's go for it and see what happens. And for sure, we didn't start up in the optimal conditions. So given that, I think we're doing quite okay. I mean, uh, we are at what, 81% or 82% funded at this moment. Mm -hmm. So we have hope that we're going to manage to reach our goal. And then hopefully we're going to manage to reach some stretch goals also, and uh, we will be able to add to our game. You guys have to have some of the best Kickstarter videos and updates that I, you know, I've seen. I was really uh, laughing. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of humor there, of course, but I, I really like the one where you and uh, uh, Dave were playing the game, like an early version and making comments about what you like to see is a lot of insight into the into the process. I'm just wondering, is that video really how you guys work, or is that just kind of a, a show for the cameras? Uh, it is how we work, but usually we don't do it uh, sitting like that. Normally, there's an entire uh, group behind us, and uh, there we're looking at them. Why do you do it like this? And they say, "Well, I don't know why. <laughs> I'll never do it again." No, it's not true. Uh, no, typically uh, we look at something, we discuss, <laughs> we take notes, then we change our minds, we go back and forth. But it's pretty much the process. Yes. I can really tell, unless you guys are really phenomenal actors, that <laughs> you're really gamers yourselves and you enjoy playing these games as much as making them. 
I can guarantee you that we're very much gamers. Personally, I was brought up by parents who didn't look at me, and I had a, a good luck that there was an arcade hall next to my where I was growing up, and so I had uh, the introduction of Pong, Pac-Man. So I have a very, very long gaming history, and I've been gaming my entire life. So, um, and I think everybody in this office has pretty much the same type of history. Not necessarily the parents that were looking at them, but uh, definitely a very deep uh, passion for games. Now you said that this game is a game for RPG gamers, by RPG gamers. I'm Did just you wondering, say uh, uh, it was on the website there that this is a game for yeah. RPG gamers by, for RPG gamers by RPG gamers. Really? That's an interplay slogan, no? Or, I know, it's four games. <laughs> That's yeah. where I saw it on the site. On yeah, the site. sorry, 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 yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, what, what does that mean to you? And what do you think is lacking in games like Skyrim and Diablo 3, for example? Ooh, don't get me started on Diablo 3. Uh, oh, please, by all means, get started on that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I played it for half an hour, so I don't even know if it's, if it's as bad as I think it is. Uh, but uh, I bought it, I bought two copies, and I brought them home, and I wanted to play them together with my girlfriends. And uh, after half an hour of just doing the same thing over and over and over, I said, I mean, where is the challenge? I didn't die. That was my major problem, actually. I was not dying. I was just like, there was nothing to be done. Nothing was challenging me. I, don't, I didn't feel any character development, uh, which I actually had with Diablo 2, especially the, the unpatched version. It was pretty tough at that time, and I, I enjoyed myself with that. So, uh, yeah, I guess it becomes more accessible. We have this entire free-to-play thing going on. Everybody has to be served right away. It's, it's a easy consumption. That seems to be the, the tenet of the day, and that's not necessarily what, what triggers me. So on a personal level, I, uh, I was very disappointed in Diablo 3. Uh, maybe also because my memories of Diablo 1 and Diablo 2 are uh, way in the past. You know, If you play an old game again today, often you're disappointed, and so it's better that it stays in memory. But I remember at the time when I was playing Diablo 2, uh, especially in multiplayer with my friends, I was having a lot of fun. And I didn't have any of that fun uh, in Diablo 3, so I was very disappointed in that. And what about Skyrim, then? <laughs> I, uh, oh, <laughs> let's skip to the next question, shall we? Uh, <laughs> what is it, I mean, what is the original sin going to have that these games lack? It's, it's, it's a question we get a lot, I mean, and so to, to, to give you a, a straightforward answer is, is hard. Um, you know, it's, it's all these little things together that, that make for, for, I think, a, a, a fun experience. Uh, you, you hear me often talk about Ultima 7, but that's really the feeling that I had when I was playing Ultima 7, or actually even Ultima 6. Uh, that's the feeling I would like to recreate and have, peel, uh, have people have that are playing our games. And so how do you do that? Uh, well, it's by having a lot of little things. You know, uh, Ultima was a game about, with fantastic world exploration. So you had a lot of item interaction going on. You had a decent amount of NPC scheduling and simulation going on. You had a shitty combat system, I have to be fair about that. It was really not a good combat system, but that's okay. I wasn't also crazy about all the reagents. Uh, how do you say re reagents? 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 Reagents, yeah. Reagents. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had a lot of fun exploring that world. So the first thing we're trying to do is make a world that is worthy of exploring. And uh, the way that we're trying to do that is by making sure there's always something to discover and that you get rewarded if you actually start uh, going off the beaten path. So uh, say that you say, oh, what's that there? There's a little red dot, so you're going to go start following the red dot. Or you say, oh, there's a bigger red dot. Oh, there's an even bigger red dot. Oh, my God, there's an entire dungeon. Oh, my God, there's an entire city. There's an entire other dimension just because you followed the little red dot. If you would not have followed the red dot, okay, fine. You never knew, you knew it was there. Nowadays, it would be like, ding, ding, watch my minimap, marker, 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 go left. You can go left by pressing A. Uh, so this kind of thing. So And uh, that's where we're different, I think. Uh, we're trying to be, um, yeah, uh, rewarding exploration at the first level. So that's the first thing. There's other things, too. Sorry, I got a bit carried away there. <laughs> You know, I had, you know, had Richard Garriott on, uh, last, maybe last episode, I think, and you know, he was also making fun of the games with exclamation points and question marks on people's heads and everything. So it seems like you, you guys are on the same wavelength as far as that's concerned. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, how are you going to manage the flow of the information? Is, are you going to have the, the logbook, uh, the quest log, or is it just going to be me here with a, an old-fashioned pen and paper, maybe some graph paper even? This uh, is your quest log. <laughs> 
And uh, you see that it has squares. You can also use it for your minimap. No. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> no. Uh, we uh, actually, we uh, discussed this for a long time. And we said we're not going to have quests per se. So we're not really going to do quests as you've uh, grown to, to know them with a quest log with a, a state machine behind it that's saying, well, you accepted the quest or you know about the quest. And now, ho-ho, oh, oh, you found first part of the quest. Oh, ho, oh, second part of the quest. And if you find the third part of the quest, quest uh, accept. Twerk. As completed, you get the quest reward right away. So now that's not going to happen. Instead, you're going to pick up pieces of information. They're going to be locked in a journal uh, that is telling you, okay, we found something about four lying statues. All right, great. Okay, we encounter a statue that can talk. Probably it's one of those four lying statues that we read about in that book. Okay. So, and eventually you're going to pick up... Uh, things and you're going to do something to those statues. You're not even going to get the word quest completed. You're just going to be like, oh, I did that with the statue and this happened. That's pretty cool because I, because of that, I found that. That's it and that's what's in your journal. And so there's no quest succeeded, no quest completed, uh, no quest failed uh, going on. So you have a lot of uh, exploration going on um, where you'll have to discover things. And it's uh, nowadays it's almost a new experience because nobody does it anymore like that. It seems like you're actually treating the gamer as though he had a brain. <laughs> I think that RPG players in general have a brain. Uh, I mean, and they've been mistreated for quite some time. So uh, I hope. Uh, I mean, you know, it's very hard from the point of, of view of a developer because you get all this information coming through your forums or your Facebook pages or what have you, uh, even by talking people in, in the street uh, that, that played your games. And uh, there's a whole sorts uh, a whole uh, wide spectrum of types of gamers so uh, I remember when we um, I don't remember which game it was I know that we had a bad quest tracking going on in a certain game so we got a lot of flack especially from a uh, US press to be honest mainstream press then and they were saying oh the quest tracking sucks and you don't know what you have to do and I remember saying oh my god who fucked up uh, but uh, if, you, if you think about it with a little bit of uh, um, a distance is that uh, why was that such a bad thing why didn't they just go talk to the characters the information was there for them to pick it up and um, we have testers that come into our office also and we look at them and they're like looking like where is it where is it where is it? I mean I'm supposed to find this body of this zombie Jake where is it where is it where is it yeah. and so they're waiting for map markers they're waiting for exclamation marks so they've been literally drilled to expect that but it's definitely I mean you're being taught very early in the game that that's not what's gonna happen this time because you you don't even make it over the first bridge uh, if you don't start exploring on your own. I hope One of the things that has me most excited about the game is the turn-based combat, which I have always been always preferred that. But I don't, you know, this is a new innovation to the Divinity series, right? So I'm wondering uh, what inspired that and how is this going to work? Is it, I'm kind of looking at the screenshots and the gameplay footage, I'm almost envisioning sort of an XCOM-like approach to combat. The words that drop here a lot in the office is Temple of Elemental Evil and uh, Fallout. Those are uh, two big sources of inspiration and there's a whole bunch of little tweaks that we're adding uh, on top of that. Uh, we're definitely not doing, I mean, the XCOM was kind of cool. Um, what was really special about XCOM was the... Um, I need to think about XCOM, so I'm not going to answer on that right away. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say, what struck me right away about XCOM is how well they handled their camera and how it added to the feeling of what you were doing. So it had a, a, a nice sense of reward, um, but I'm not sure if that's what I wanted to say. So I'll need to think about that. Sorry about that. What just inspired the move to uh, turn-based? From it's kind of known for action role-playing games. So what? Why the shift now to this more tactical turn-based model? Uh, we always wanted to make a turn-based combat game. Actually, Beyond Divinity was originally intended to be turn-based combat, and it was um, thrown out uh, at E3, actually, uh, because we figured out nobody wanted to buy it amongst the distributors and publishers. And so we came back from E3, and we said, okay, well, there's no way that we're going to ever sell this game if we don't do something. So uh, we went to action uh, RPG mode again, and ta-da, a month later, we had the contract signed for pretty much everywhere in the world. So uh, there was no market uh, amongst the publishers uh, at that time. And... Uh, 
uh, we didn't have digital distribution, we couldn't go direct to, to players, so um, that was impossible. And then with Divinity 2, it had to come out on console if ever we wanted to have the budget to make that game. So that was definitely, a, if I would have walked into a meeting saying it's going to be turn-based combat, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so now that we're self-publishing, we can, we can do turn-based combat. So that was a very easy decision to take. Um, although, to be honest, when we started out in the first month or so, we were actually still contemplating uh, doing the action RPG style of combat. But uh, it went away very, very fast. And we were just oh, thank you for that. I, I'm a huge. I I am so tired of action. I like the turn-based stuff. Me too. I'm, I'm just wondering how long. I'm thinking of some of my favorite turn-based games. Uh, the battles sometimes can last for hours. I'm wondering what. How is it about original sin? We're talking uh, 30 second battles, five minutes. I mean, what's the typical length of a battle going to be? Um, there's a that in, in that Kickstarter video. There's a one piece, uh, one battle that we're doing uh, with uh, zombies and um, a skeleton bomber coming towards you. And I think it was about ten minutes uh, that we spent in in that fight. Uh, and to be fair, we actually, when we were shooting that video, we died three times. So we never showed the ending of the fight because we didn't manage. But we're still balancing everything and so forth. Now this is going to be a party-based game. Is a that's what I understand. Yeah. So what I'm wondering, uh, do you get to create all your characters yourself or are some NPCs that join you, henchmen kind of thing? I mean, how is that going to work? It's going to depend a bit on how the Kickstarter goes, actually, because there's plans that we have to change parts of that. But so you start out with two characters. Uh, yes, you can play as a man and a man. You can play as a woman and a woman. You can play as a man and a woman. It's a bit of a mistake on our side uh, there initially. Uh, but that's been fixed now. Um, so uh, you find henchmen in the world at this moment. And these henchmen are as plain as they can be. They're just like uh, special character builds with uh, specialization. They're healer, henchman, priest, henchman, etc. Uh, so what we hope to do uh, if the Kickstarter uh, funding is successful is to add a stretch goal in which you can uh, turn the henchmen into real uh, party members and real companions with their backgrounds, their histories and uh, their own uh, character arcs. So uh, I really hope we're going to get a chance of doing that. But the thing is, it's a lot of work to do that because it's um, the, the, I don't know if you've noticed, but the world of the Divinity Original Sin is really very interactive. So there's a lot of reaction going on in what you're doing. And um, whenever we do something extra on the side of what the player can interact with, we have to take care of it all over the place. Well, what classes will be available? We don't have classes. It's classless. So you have a system in which uh, you pick your skills yourself and you build the build that you want. It's very much uh, Divinity-inspired in that sense. And in, in a way, if you want, it was also a little bit like you had in Ultima 7, actually. It was just you had the circles of magic that you could uh, learn as an avatar, but you also had his weaponry, and that was it. I'm actually, you know, the, you mentioned the objects and how you can interact. I was watching the videos and saw how you could combine all of the things. I'm already thinking of some really clever ways to uh, to kill rats. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering if, you know, you're thinking about going beyond combat, I mean, uh, armor and weapons, and maybe have adventure game style elements where you could, you're combining uh, elements to solve puzzles. You know, yeah. have, you, have you thought in that direction? Yeah, it's what we're doing. I mean, we did it originally in the first Divinity, I think. There were ways that you could solve quests just by uh, clever um, uh, object manipulation. Uh, and there's also things that if you don't uh, start fooling around with the objects, you'll never discover in the game, uh, including areas. Uh, it is um, one, of, one of the central, well, not central, that sounds uh, wrong. Uh, one of the things we repeat a lot towards uh, our designers is that uh, it's not because you made it that the player has to go there. Uh, he has to discover it, and if he discovers it, then it's going to be cool for him because that's going to be his reward. And that's something that's really repeated. For a designer, of course, it sucks like hell because he spent like two months of his life working on an area, and there's a chance that the player never sees it. But we, we, there's the same, and in the same reasoning, it's uh, like we showed on the last update video. We said, okay, everybody can be killed, and we actually made it a rule that the game has to be uh, finishable by killing everybody that you encounter in the game. It's not going to make you a very popular person, obviously, but you should have the ability in this particular game to do the equivalent of an Armageddon spell and uh, then uh, try to figure out how you can still do what you have to do in the game. I deviated there, so I forgot your question. I'm sorry. You know, I, I know you said we shouldn't try to wrap our brain around how this, the characters, in, multi, in multiplayer mode, the characters can drop in and out of the, of the battles from real time. And I know you said we shouldn't try to even contemplate that, but you know, come, on, come on, how's it going to work? 
But it's uh, it's really straightforward, you know. I mean, um, you're talking about turn-based combat, right? About, uh, right, just, you know, one player is in turn-based combat, another player is running around, and then they can drop in, I guess, and pop out. I don't, you know, how's it going to work exactly? Uh, well, you have to be careful with the word player first. It's your party member, right? So whether he's controlled by another human or by your AI or by yourself, that's uh, as you want. So the thing is that uh, as you are uh, in turn-based combat, time is continuing. So um, say that uh, you are uh, in combat on your own and I'm walking around in the city, then that's okay. I mean, I'm just running around in real time, whereas you are just waiting in uh, your turn-based combat. And if I would then approach combat, I will join it. Right? Uh, if both of us are not in combat, and uh, for instance, um, we let those orcs inside uh, in that movie, we let them inside of a harbor, then they're going to be uh, fighting each other, uh, simulating turn-based combat in discrete slices of time that, that pro uh, proceed. So basically, each turn then is equivalent to, what, five seconds or ten seconds or whatever. And so they're going to keep on fighting each other. And then when we join it, they're going to say, ah, no, one of the players is there, so we're going to enter into turn-based combat. Probably didn't make sense at all to you, but... Uh, <laughs> It works. It works really well. I mean, and there's. Uh, it's why one of the reasons we went on the press tour is because if we ever try to explain this to people, they're not going to believe us. So we're going to show it a lot, so that there's a lot of testimonials about. Yeah, this this feels very natural, and it it, it really feels natural. Uh, but if you start thinking about it, uh, it's uh, it's like why are we here on this on this earth? Why do we exist? It's one of why do we <laughs> exist? Indeed, I was uh, intrigued by the interplayer relationships. I was thinking of co-op, and I'm wondering, you know, do you, do you sort of see husbands and wives, uh, you know, p sig <laughs> significant others uh, playing this together? Because there is a possibility that these characters could fall in love with each other, right? Um, so, let me, uh, let, let me go like this and this. So, it's not about a love relationship. All right. There is a possibility that their affection becomes very high for one another, that's for sure. But it is not a love relationship, despite the hand-holding that you see in that main image, which has gotten so much nice comments about it. Uh, it is not a, a love relationship. They can, we have two, two axes that we're tracking. It's, one is called affection, the other one is called affinity. Affection means how much do they like each other. They might hate each other and still continue to reach uh, work towards their goal. And then we have uh, affinity. How do they think about things? Do they think alike about uh, moral dilemmas? Do they think uh, that it's okay um, for, uh, well, in the beginning of that video we showed like, uh, okay, those guys, they're in our way, we're just going to kill them. Their contempt goes up. It's a little bit drastic. Uh, but uh, if they would have disagreed, then their uh, affinity would uh, go in the opposite direction. And that's going to have an impact later on in the game. So there's no possibility of accidentally ending up as your, your friend's gay lover. It's going to be a conscious choice. <laughs> if, you, if you go for that, fine. I mean, who are we to stop you? Uh, but it's not, that's not the main theme of the game. Sure. Uh, so you've got the option in here to talk to animals. Mm -hmm. How is that going to play out? So you're both source um, hunters turned who are asked to use, start learning to use the source. It's kind of a special magic uh, in the um, Divinity Universe. And uh, one of the things that comes with the deal is the ability to talk to animals. And so there's a whole bunch of animals in the game that you can query, and they have a different perspective on things, obviously. And often in quests, you'll find that animal empathy can be a very useful thing uh, to have. It's actually a feature I wanted to have already in there since Divine Divinity. So uh, every single game, it was scratched. So this time, I made sure that it was there from the very beginning. Uh, but uh, it's there right now as a, a, in the version that you're seeing, everybody has it. But we're going to limit it again because at some point you will have to earn it. And if you don't have it, then you will not have those conversations with animals, which, are going, which is going to increase the, the richness of the world, actually. Yeah, I saw a pretty funny scene in the, the video where you guys were exploding sheep. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you know, what about those that want to pursue a more meaningful relationship with a sheep? Yeah. You want to have a more meaningful <laughs> Not me personally, of course not. But. <laughs> with, uh, if you want to have a meaningful... Well, actually... So, uh, no, there is no sheep henchman right now. Uh, there is a big talk about a weird sheep making a, a, an entry into the game. Uh, but uh, you cannot have a deep, meaningful, personal relationship with sheep yet. 
Uh, although I have to say I'm really attracted by that ID. I find it a, uh, one of the better IDs. I can tell you that you will have to make a tough moral decision about the sheep some, at some point in the game. And a rabbit and a cow. Is that right, David? Oh. Yeah. So I, don't, I haven't seen anything like this co-op dialogue system nope. in uh, other games. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, you can sort of get the idea how it's going to work, but uh, I'm just wondering, is this like a, some kind of algorithm that's, that's running in the background determining which of the choices gets made? No. Uh, hold on. Are you so, talking about single player or multiplayer? A multiplayer. But you, as players, you make the choices yourselves, huh? So why would there be an algorithm running? Also, there's no way that two players playing co-op can vote on a, <clears throat> a decision about uh, what gets said in dialogue. You, you always ah, okay, sorry, yes, no, no, I understand your question. No, we didn't show that because it wasn't ready when we were making the video. Uh, but normally, you, whenever there's a discussion going on, you get uh, the option to decide uh, if you're going to try charm, intimidation, reasoning, maybe a few others that we're going to add, and then the game is going to look at a couple of things. It's going to look at um, the stats of the player. Uh, so, if you're going to try to charm, it's going to look at your persuasion and your uh, constitution. Uh, if you're going to try to reason, it's obviously going to look at intelligence and at persuasion. We're still fooling around with the rules there, so it might change, so don't quote me on that. Uh, and then it's also going to look at the context of the situation. So, for instance, we're running away in a dungeon, there's a big bad monster uh, hunting us. I shouldn't start trying to charm you when deciding which exit to take. All right. So, it's, you know, intimidation is going to work there, reasoning is going to work there, but charming is going to have a penalty. And so, both players uh, select uh, the charm option, intimidate option, reason option. Game looks at what the context is, which has been pre-scripted. And then out of that, it calculates who is the winner of the conversation and says, well, we'll do it your way or we'll do it your way. So pretty much like, uh, well, we're, I'm not pretty much, I mean, we're just trying to simulate, obviously, what you would be doing in a pen and paper RPG where the party has to decide on a major thing and uh, five guys say, no, we're going to do it like that. And then the other guy says, well, you know, okay, I don't agree, but we'll do it because you guys said it. But we're, yeah, it, that's going to be the output of some charming or reasoning or hitting each other or too much alcohol on one side of the table, so something like, along those lines. I see you've got some skills in the game, clock picking, uh, for example. Are you planning to make those any of those into mini-games? No. Uh, so, uh, lock picking is going to, well, there's two, lock picking isn't in yet. So you've seen maybe AI, yeah, you probably saw the little icons with the lock picking. It's going to be in. And uh, right now it's going to be item based and dexterity based. So your, your dexterity with the lock pick is going to decide if you can open uh, the door yes or no, or the chest yes or no, or the trap is going to spring yes or no. I know that the, the source is a really important part of this game. The four, the, all the four elements working together electrifying water, or ice, and fire. I'm just wondering how is it is going to be absolutely critical to go with the the source abilities in the game, or is that just a, an option you can take? It's more than uh, just the elemental forces. So uh, we've only been showing those uh, partially because we're still implementing all the other ones. Uh, but um, the source extends uh, to um, warrior skills. It extends to ranger skills. It extends to survivalist skills. We call them uh, so roguelike skills. So all of them are affected in you uh, by this um, grand unifying uh, magic power, which is uh, the source. So I know the editor is a really huge selling point of this. And I love the idea of you can kickstart this thing and then later you'll have an editor that you can make your own adventures with, uh, with your friends. I mean, is the goal of the ed editor to make it so uh, easy for a novice or is it more about really powerful features that you could use to make a really slick uh, level? It's more of the latter. It's a power tool because it's a tool that we are using to develop. So it has usability functions to accelerate our work and uh, they are quite powerful. But it allows you, I mean, you can pretty much, I mean, if you would want to make a, uh, let's say, a multiplayer version of Penscape Torment, you could. Yeah, I mean, you could you could be Morty, I could be the other guy, uh, and uh, or if you'd want to make an Ultima Seven where you would be Dupree and uh, David Yolo and I obviously would be the Avatar, uh, we could do that also. 
so you can you can do a lot with it. It's really a very powerful tool. It's uh, based partially on the tech uh, that we've been using over uh, what, what is it now? I think twelve years already. I mean, uh, even LMK was using parts of it. So and it's evolved over the years. It uh, uses processes that we've. Um, uh, improved over the years also. I mean, we're a fairly small team and we're making fairly large games with that small team. And it's thanks to the technology that we're going to be sharing with people that this is uh, possible. Are there plans in place for, let's say you've got somebody making levels with this thing and they're really, really good. Is there, are you going to be able to offer those on a, on a website for fans to download or maybe even buy it and make it DLC? I mean, we uh, are going to integrate it with Steamworks. So it's going to be possible for people uh, to sell it if they want. Uh, we are uh, going to have some kind of thing which we don't know exactly yet where we are going to centralize everything where people who don't use Steam can also share their levels. But that is really something that is still in the, in the works. So chances are that when we start up, it's going to be Steamworks plus like an, an, a place where you can just exchange levels because they're ultimately they're like a zip file that you copy in a folder and off you go. So and uh, we'll see how far we get. We'll also see how far the Kickstarter goes. I mean, our focus really right now is making the game as good as we can. And the, the editor tool is powerful already. Uh, and then we will see how the community picks it up, and if they pick it up, we're going to support the hell out of it, obviously. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about uh, DRM. I mean, you did say you didn't want to have DRM a few times. I just wonder if I could persuade you, because I know a lot of the fans are demanding uh, lens lock and, and Star Force and things. So that's maybe a code wheel. I mean, have you thought about any adding any DRM to this? No. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to put a code wheel in? Like, uh, I, yeah. Static value, I think that's kind of okay. I mean, I remember we were talking about uh, when uh, SimCity was coming out. Um, SimCity used to come out with this uh, extremely dark uh, reddish paper where you could almost not read the very, very, very small font so that you could not make a copy from it. So we could do that. It's kind of cool. Uh, Maybe could that could be one of the stretch goals that would be kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Forget to two million, you know, then we'll have Star Force or something. Uh, and uh, we we had our we had our share of problems with Star Force in the past. We used Star Force; it was not our choice, uh, but we did it, so we're guilty. And uh, it was a very very bad idea. To this date, uh, it's still for pursuing us because we did this Divinity Anthology thing, and we're trying to recompile stuff, and we are running into all this copy protection stuff. It's uh, it's, it's a disaster. Copy protection is bad. Yeah? Well, you mentioned that you've got some new stretch goals. I'm actually very happy about the. Also, the tiers, the sort of uh, feelies, extras, and things you're offering with these tiers, uh, even a cloth map, uh, mm. was that, what, $125, I think, for the cloth yeah. map? Matt, I'm going to admit to you, I don't know when it starts, but I'll look right now. Yeah, $95, exactly. Did you have a, was it hard to, to come up with rewards that wouldn't cost us, you know, as more to make uh, than it would be worth uh, to get uh, you know, in terms of a pledge? Sense. I think we made several mistakes there, for sure. Uh, but okay, I mean, uh, you know the anthology that we released? Uh, I'm looking if I have one here, but uh, it's too far away. We uh, already like burned ourselves a, a little bit on that one. So for sure, we're going to burn us on some of the rewards also. Uh, but okay, I mean, as long as we don't burn ourselves too hard, we're going to manage uh, the cloth map. Uh, that's going to be okay, I think. Uh, the boxes will be okay. The art book will be okay. Uh, so we should be okay. Uh, it's not too, it's not too bad. In any case, we also have a retail release, so and, and we, we're going to make this stuff anyway. Is there a tier that you think that the? I mean, if you want the full experience, mm -hmm. is there sort of a minimal tier that you think uh, fans need to select to get the? Other than the, the ten thousand. Full on original <laughs> sin experience, you know. The full original sin experience. I haven't experienced the full original sin <laughs> itself yet, so it's still been development. I mean, there's parts of the world where it's just like completely empty right now. Um, so, uh, if you want the full original system, well, you just have to get the base game right. So you should have it. I think it's a lot of people are going to be surprised by how well it plays with a friend. I know there's a lot of guys who think that you can only play it in single player if you want to be a real RPG and the moment you put co-op in an RPG it's like a disaster and you gave up to the masses and law and so forth. But they're wrong. They're, they're simply wrong. I mean, it's, uh, it plays as well in single player as it does in multiplayer. Multiplayer has the additional benefit that you know your party member is a friend and he doesn't necessarily do what you want him to do. So there's a little bit of tension going on there and we, we promote that tension with our cooperative dialogue system and it's a lot of fun. 
I mean, uh, so uh, I think that when people are going to get it in their hands, they'll, they're, they'll understand why we've had so many ecstatic press reports uh, of guys who actually played it that way. Because in general, our presentations, we weren't hand-holding. We just said, journalist A, journalist B, you sit there, go on and play, and play together. So that's, uh, that's what I would be doing with you now. If it, uh, the Steam integration would be finished already, but it's not. <laughs> just a couple last questions here, Swin. I was looking back, I was kind of curious, I wanted to go back and look at the like original reviews, contemporary reviews of the earlier Divinity games. And, mm -hmm. uh, the first one was just through the roof, you know, people were praising it uh, yeah. to the skies. Uh, this, then when we got to uh, Divinity 2, though, I noticed there were some criticisms about the game uh, being too difficult for some people. They, they thought it was the imbal uh, imbalanced, I guess, in terms of uh, difficulty, the plot wasn't so strong and so on. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, do you think that's fair criticism of that? Uh, of Divinity 2, and if you think it, that it is, uh, what are you doing with Original Sin to make sure that doesn't happen again? Same mistakes, I guess. Uh, so, Div 2, well, clearly we had a very problematic development cycle there, and the game was late, it was uh, buggy, we had to remove a lot of features which were in the original vision, so clearly we were too ambitious for what we are trying to do, dominantly because we were going to console. This was the dominant reason. Had this been a PC game, it would have been ready a year earlier and it would be in much better shape. So um, you were looking at the result of a lot of compromise, uh, so just trying to finish the production. Shit happens. Um, but before that, it was already bad with Beyond Divinity because Beyond Divinity wasn't the best game in the world either. That was actually a survival project because we, after Divine Divinity, we had zero. We never got a, a dollar of royalty from uh, Divine Divinity. And it was only because it was starting to sell a little bit that we could do a Beyond Divinity. But we had to be very fast in releasing something. And uh, so we did. And that worked out. And then Div 2, we said, okay, well, let's try to do it on Kozol because this was next gen and PC is dead and stuff like that. And we were scared that we were not going to get a deal for PC, which was true. If we didn't offer Xbox 360, then nobody wanted to make a sign a deal with us. So, but yeah, we succumbed uh, under the pressure. And now with the Original Sin, the big difference is that we are doing it as, uh, as our own project, where there's no publisher involved. I mean, there's a little bit of pressure from uh, our investors, there's a little bit of pressure from the distributors that we're working with, but you cannot compare it at all with what we had in the past in terms of publishing pressure. I mean, with CDV, you should see the letters that I have, have, that, that I have here uh, threatening me to, to, to sue me until the, the, all the way into, into the inner circle of hell, uh, and even then more, send a lawyer there so that I would... I, man, you can you have no idea. Uh, so and uh, what kind of issues do they have? Well, the same problem with Larian all the time. We we care really a lot about our game, so we don't want to stop, and we keep on trying things and iterating and say, oh, this is better, so let's do this. So if nobody stops us, we're going to keep on developing until the end of time. So here, our natural end draw is going to be how much money do we have? So once we run out of money, we have to ship it. Uh, but I think that by then we will sh we should be okay. Uh, I hope. I mean, we'll do our best, but uh, we are who we are, right? All right I have a question from a fan here. Uh, mm -hmm. named, I think his name is Zagon, so the X, so I'm just guessing. Zagon2012 says, question for the Larian guys. I like Divinity 2 a lot. I was, however, very disappointed by the ending. It was, it was a cliffhanger, and you know, it goes on in that vein for a while. So he wants to know, I guess, what you what you thought about the ending, why, do you, why you did it that way. If I go to Raccoonies? <laughs> Just says Divinity 2 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I, I do want to say, to finish up on the previous story, we did fix a lot of things with Dragon Knight Saga. So if you look at the ratings for Dragon Knight Saga, they were a lot higher than for uh, Divinity 2, Ego Draconis. So I, I do want to say uh, that that wasn't all that bad. But um, the ending story. Well, uh, <laughs> so in Divine Divinity, it, it goes back to Divine Divinity actually. So in Divine Divinity, I made the wrong call in... Um, not cutting what an area which was called Wastelands. Uh, so there were a couple of guys on the team who said we should end the game at the Council of Seven, which is a major moment in Divine Divinity, and not continue with the Wastelands because we'll never manage to finish it in time. And on the other hand, I had my publisher pressure. If there is not a screenshot with orange stuff, we are going to sue you. So... <laughs> I, I succumbed and I made screenshots with orange stuff, which was my desert, uh, because they wanted to be able to show variety in the environment, and otherwise everything was green and you had a bit of mountains at best. 
So uh, when it then came to Divinity 2 and I found myself in the same shit where we had to make cuts and cuts, you don't want to know how much I got in that game, I uh, figured that uh, I'd better stop with the cliffhanger ending uh, and cut hard rather than uh, just uh, a- add areas on top of it which would not have anything in them, which was what would have happened if I wouldn't have ended the game where we ended it. But it, mean, it meant that the game wasn't finished there yet. So, uh, And that's then where uh, Flames of Vengeance came in, because that then was the continuation of the game. A bit artificial, to be honest, uh, because it wasn't exactly supposed to be that way. But uh, yeah, that's what we could come up with. And you would be surprised at, uh, under, under how much pressure those decisions are sometimes made. Uh, it is, um, so it was definitely not the best design in the world. It was definitely not the story that we started out with. It was uh, by far not the game that I hoped that it was going to be. Um, but in hindsight, if I look at what the Dragonite saga is, which is then the divinity that you have to look at, because that's what we ultimately did. Uh, I don't think it was such a bad game. I mean, I think there's a lot of really good moments in Divinity 2. Uh, and uh, that ending, well, there's something to be said for it. It wasn't that bad. I can imagine that if it's the end of the game and you don't have any hope of anything else coming after, you say, what the hell? Yeah, but I mean, uh, we did put in the happy ending at the end. So, um, so but we learn. We learn as we progress. So you'll see what we came up this time. Uh, that'll be interesting. Well, one thing that's been praised in all the games is the music, uh, the soundtrack. <laughs> At least we do something. Uh, <laughs> what's this? Kirill, I don't know how to pronounce this. Kirill Pokrovsky. Kirill Pokrovsky. 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 Yeah. I, just, uh, I actually went back and was listening to the Divinity uh, soundtrack again. I mean, it is just amazing stuff. But I assume, is, is he going to be around for Original Sin? Yes, he's supposed to finish all of his music soon. So uh, he hasn't, but he's supposed to. So uh, luckily we still have a bit of development going on. So he did finish all of the music for Dragon Commander, though. So, uh, well, he's supposed to, so we'll see. Uh, what's, but, yeah, what's going on with Dragon Commander? A lot of things. It's a, uh, I think it's going to be a game that's going to take a lot of people by surprise. So we had um, our uh, lead writer and uh, lead animator, they spent just a month in London recording with very, very good actors, uh, more dialogue than we've ever recorded in our history, that includes our previous RPGs. And this is just to be able to cater for the choice and consequence that's present in Dragon Commander. So for an RPG point of view, I think you're going to enjoy that part. It's, it's really good. I mean, I was pl- oh, I, obviously I'm going to say it's really good, but I'm really proud of what they've done. It looks beautiful also. So, And uh, if I look to my right side, there's an entire room full of players uh, play, beating the hell out of each other uh, yeah. in uh, combat and in campaign mode. So. I think it's a cool game. I mean, it's a, it's different. It's a complex game. It's probably the most complex game we've ever made from a gameplay point of view because it was really hard to make all the, the little pieces fit to each one another. But it also fits in um, that that vision that uh, you know originally when when I was younger, uh, games were not being made as it's an FPS, it's an RTS, it's this genre. It was just like here's an experience of. And then I always refer to cinemaware games, like an experience of you are the rocket ranger, you are the defender of the crown. So this is what we try to do with uh, Dragon Commander. Are you an Amiga fan by any chance? Or? Oh, yes. I played a lot on the Amiga. I started with a ZX81, so I had 1K of memory. Made my first game on that, actually. And then I moved to a Commodore 64. From there, I went to the Amiga. Uh, 2000, actually, yeah. Then 2000, from 2000 to a 500, uh, because I blew up the 2000. My parents weren't very happy, uh, and uh, then uh, I went to PC. A 386 was my first PC, and then I stuck to PC actually. But now I have a Mac. Look at that. You still have some of your old computers sitting around? I do, but uh, a lot of them broke, unfortunately. My Commodore 64 is the most spectacular one because the fuse broke, and I put in another fuse, but I didn't really look well at what fuse I would put in there, so it, it melted completely overnight. It's rather spectacular, actually. Maybe I should pick a, a picture of it online. Uh, but, I, yeah, I, uh, I like my old machines. So something you know, I ask all the folks I have along with the Kickstarter projects is, you know, let's just say you're the RPG gamer. you got 50 bucks. You know, you're looking at this... Uh, original Sin mm-hmm. Kickstarter page, and you, 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 you kind of like, I don't know. I mean, what would you personally need to hear about it or see or know about it before you'd say, okay, I'm definitely definitely stepping into this? Uh, in our case, because we're already quite advanced in development, it's really a matter of um, 
if you invest in it now, this is a slogan, right? Okay, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, but if you invest in it now, you're going to have more fun in a couple of months. Well, another couple of months this fall, hopefully, maybe winter, we'll see. But and uh, So you're basically investing in your own pleasure in the future. If you're planning on buying it, if you're saying, this is my type of RPG, and you know the stuff that we've done in the, ba in the past wasn't perfect, but it wasn't that bad either, so maybe we'll do better this time, then maybe you're, you're, you're better off uh, investing into it now because you're really... As a developer, what we're doing is we're saying, like, guys, this is future profits, which we are now going to invest in the development of the game. So give it to us now so that we can put it in the game because that's what we want to do. I think that's the, the, great, the best part about Kickstarter because we got some criticism. People say, oh, you got a game that's already funded and now you want to have more of our money. You're just trying to get money out of our pockets. Well, first of all, Obviously, when the game is going to sell, I'm going to try to get money from you because I need to break even. I need to be able to build my next game. Uh, but second of all, uh, we're now offering it at a reduced price. And uh, by, by, by taking that money, we're putting it back into the game. So we're trying to make it better. So we're, we're just giving it to, back to you in a different form. It's a pixelated form, but in a, in a different form. So I, that's, that's basically why I decided that it was okay to come to Kickstarter with uh, a game which is already uh, far advanced because we're looking at the original sim, we're looking at all these beautiful systems. Like, there's really a lot of it in there. And we're saying like we are not pushing it as far as we could push it because we don't have enough resources, not enough time, not enough budgets. Right? So if we could get more, then we can make this really good. Uh, I mean, if I'm 100% honest, I would probably want a, a, an extra year like, and a team of 50 people extra to make this the most fantastic RPG you've ever played. Now, obviously, I'm not going to get that, uh, but uh, so we'll do the best that we can. Well, one last question, Ned. You know, being there in Belgium, which uh, is a country that for me means only, well, maybe two things now, Larian, but mostly ale. Really? Uh, don't tell me you're not a drinker. I, I, that would break my heart. You know, I, <laughs> what are your favorite ales there? Uh, I like a beer which is called um, uh, Brugse Zot. Uh, I like, but it's uh, wow. it's from my home. It's the city where I was born from, uh, where I was born. Uh, I uh, there is an um, it's called Amber Beer, but I don't know how I would uh, say that. But if you want to have the beer that's supposed to be the best, it's called West Vleteren. Uh, it's from an abbey. You cannot buy it in the shop. You have to go to the abbey to get it. Uh, it's voted, it was voted best beer in the world uh, some time ago. So uh, I've tried it. I'm not crazy about it, but a lot of people say, well, this is really fantastic. So maybe they're right. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's, a, there's quite a few ones. If ever you come to Belgium, go to the city of Bruges. In Bruges, there's a bar. In that bar, you will find a uh, collection of every single beer, he claims, that there is to be found in, in Belgium. It's a very big, big uh, collection. You guys, I mean, I just imagine you must be like the ultimate beer snobs. Like going to other no, other places, especially the U.S. Oh my God, have you ever tried a Budweiser? I d I did actually. I spent uh, 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 several months when I was a kid, uh, when I was thirteen or so, in Idaho, uh, and uh, in a place called Riggins, population one hundred and eighteen, and they had a Bud Light and Coors Light, and uh, um, yes, it was indeed. Uh, it was not exactly the best beer in the world. Let's put it that way. <laughs> But it was very light, that's for sure. I mean, that's why they let me drink it. Uh, it was extremely light. I do, not, I do not recommend drinking or beer the way that you would be drinking butter or Coors Light, for sure. All right, uh, Swin. Well, thanks so much for the interview. Is there anything else you wanted to add or you know, questions I didn't ask that you wish I had, that sort of thing? No, uh, I could use some uh, suggestions for the stretch goals. <laughs> <laughs> We just had a major fight in the office, uh, and everybody's still cooling down from uh, what are we going to put in the stretch goal. So, no, we're not going to do that. Are we going to remove the keywords, or are we going to stay with the keywords, that kind of stuff? I've already given you a great idea, the lens lock, uh, the star force. You want me to put that in? Yeah, that could be this you know, great stretch goal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What kind of ideas are you kicking around? Uh, we're thinking, well, obviously, we want our henchmen to become companions. Mm -hmm. And we would like to introduce a perk system. 
because we think we can do a lot of stuff with that, would make a lot of sense. Uh, we are uh, fooling around with the idea of uh, giving you, uh, we called it a, a shelter at the end of time. It's like we have this imp historian in the game and it's like a pocket universe you can travel to. It starts out as a very barren place uh, and there's a few inhabitants which you have to get rid of, but it's his gift to you. And so you have to quest a little bit around it, but ultimately you can turn it into this really cozy place over time as you progress through the game. It's your house, but it's your house that's in your pocket. So it's uh, that kind of thing. Uh, what we'd also uh, like to add is uh, um, yeah, some more customer. Uh, what we'd really like to add is playable races, but that's 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 a nut job. That's right. It's a nut job in the sense that it would really be a high stretch goal because it's a very expensive proposition because uh, of the way the game reacts to who the players are. So it makes a very big difference between the two players uh, because of their different backgrounds. And it's going to, if you would, for instance, play as an orc, we would have to cater for that all over the dialogue line. So that's a, that's a big one. Uh, what else do we have in there? Uh, I think those are the, the, the major ones that we've been throwing around. Yeah? And did I forget something, David? No. No, that's the one. So um, trying what to. What about voice acting? Have you? Are you going to have all the characters have voice acting? Put that in a stretch goal. Isn't that a very high production value thing to do? We could. I mean, but it's. Uh, I don't know if it's that tangible or that. Personally, I would prefer then to have. Um, I personally would like us to put the perks in there. I think that's the one thing that's missing here because we have a, a system where in cooperation. So, for instance, say that uh, well, we show that in the video. I think uh, you are um, you're contempt contemptuous. The game decided you are a contemptuous person because three times you've did something that is falling in that category, or you are. Uh, let's no, you're not a very polite person. Listen, let's take an easier example. Uh, you've been impolite, 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 aggressive, aggressive, aggressive. So it's a, then you gain the perk aggressive. All right, so uh, that perk can then be get used to your advantage in combat. You get a little bit of stats, and like this, we have a whole bunch of the social stats that we are tracking, and there's a lot of stuff that we could do with that um, easily in the game by putting a bit of effort in it. So I think that would be cool, uh, because that would also then uh, extend to party synergy. Uh, for instance, if we agree on everything all the time, then we got get bonuses on using skills together. Uh, where we make combos uh, with one another. That's kind of fun. Uh, but if we disagree with one another also, then we're much better off not do, using that synergy between each other. So it's, uh, it's that kind of thing which we would like to add. So if I would have to choose between that and voices, I would definitely go for, 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 for that. Uh, same thing goes for uh, my uh, companions. I mean, uh, I would like them, you know, in, in Dragon Commander, you can't see this, uh, but it is a very... Um, complex system of choice and consequence with a lot of it's really it's, it really goes very far I don't think any RPG ever did this and we can only do it because of the way that um, this, this game is constructed you wouldn't be able to do it in an RPG like Original Sin but you can do it uh, with a party you can do it within the party relationships and so that's why we um, now have flat henchmen because the next step would be those complex party relationships where there's a whole bunch of branching choice and consequence in function of how you treat them and uh, ideally also in function of who the players are in their social stats or in their perks. So there's a whole bunch of complex systems there to, to play with. And that's the area that we would like to explore more uh, in stretch goals. So uh, obviously we could put voice recording. It would be easy yeah, because we just don't have any extra development work there. Well, not a, not a lot of extra development work uh, to do so, but it's more um, of the former that we would like to, to add. Maybe bringing on some professional authors. That's uh, but that's a hard thing to embed uh, at this point in the development. I mean, it would be good to. I mean, we have a pretty good author. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I think he's pretty good. I mean, and we've tried in the past to work with a bunch of writers, uh, external writers, but if they haven't done a video game before, it's very hard to embed them. It's they are often surprised by um, the the laws of of. Um, of a game, they're different than they are in the classic narrative, where you would uh, just have like your linear storyline. If it's non-linear, there's a whole bunch of things that you have to take into account, especially. And this seems to be the hardest part for them that they have no control over what type of progression there's going to be. You know, there's a there's this guy he he, he wrote a book. Um, uh, in, oh, what did he call it? Um, what a meaningful nonlinear resequencing. Yeah, that was it. Uh, and uh, what he basically said is like, if you have four chunks of story and you have chunk A, B, C, D, the sequence which you hear it can completely change the story. 
right? So if you encounter the Indians and they're mourning, they're mourning, for instance, right? It's the example he gives, I think. And uh, so you say, okay, I encountered Indians that are mourning. Yeah? And then you go a little bit further and you discover, ah, uh, a child fell from a cliff. All right, so he said, okay, well, I'll try from forward. Yeah, that's fun. But if you would have uh, played uh, the game differently, you would have, uh, and, uh, and step three would have been, you find the child somewhere at the bottom of the cliff. Now, if you would play the game differently, and you would first encounter the child, and then you see the Indians mourning, you would immediately <laughs> resonate much harder with that, because you know, wow, I, this is the child that I've encountered that they're mourning about. So the, the, the sequence in which you tell your story has a very big impact on how the development of the of the, the, the player's uh, experience is going to be. Maybe it's not the best example in the world, but I hope that you understand what I mean. So, and this particular um, complexity is, is hard for, for writers to deal with, and not all of them have the uh, almost um, engineering like background that is required to see all of, uh, of the web of narrative that's going on. And uh, so they're rare, the writers that can do this very well, I, I find. Yeah. We've tried uh, writers um, by giving them full script and they said, okay, here's the script and you go on about it and just changing the lines, make it better writing, but it doesn't work that, uh, that well. So it's a lot of work. I don't know if my brother was here, he would ask for controller support. Ah, yes. Uh, to be fair, it's actually a game which would work well on, on, on console, I think, uh, with a controller also. Uh, so, you, I mean, if, you would, if you're playing it as a couple, which is definitely possible, or two friends, and you put it on a, on a big screen with split screen and a camera zooming in and out, you would have a lot of, you would have a lot of fun. Uh, but we, we killed that fairly early in, uh, in development because we couldn't maintain um, both modes, uh, because they, they're very different and they would require really a lot of work. That would be a cool stretch goal, but I'm not sure that the, the Kickstarter crowd would be so crazy about uh, us saying we're going to put controller in there. They seem to be fairly hardcore PC-centric, uh, so uh, we are a little bit like us, to be honest. But Would you invest in a controller support version? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I, if it meant that I could play with uh, some of my friends that only have that only play with controllers, you know, I might consider it, but I'm very much like uh, you guys seem to be very PC centric. Yeah, well, we, yeah, we are. I mean, we are PC centric uh, on our own, but that doesn't mean that we cannot appreciate playing with a, with a controller. I mean, uh, in the context of a, a co op gameplay. All right, so there you would want to play it with the controller on one screen if that's the only thing you have available. And there you would probably want to make a console version or, or hook up your PC to a, to a big screen. It would make sense. I mean, it's not that it's a, it's not a bad thing. I mean, controller, the thing about a controller is you're holding it like this. Whereas if you can control the whole thing with the mouse, then you can get this hand on the mouse and the other hand, of course, holding a beer. Uh, so there's <laughs> kind of a fundamental problem with me. Have you ever tried the Baxter? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Never mind. It's an old joke. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, thanks again. Uh, I'll probably have this posted by uh, Sunday. Okay. Uh, so hopefully get some more. You know, Arp, you know the guys at the RPG Codex? Uh, yes. <laughs> I do. Hi, guys. I already I read lots this of requests interview. from them for, to what? get you on. Say that again? I got a lot of requests from them to get you on here. Yes, well, that's very nice of them. I, uh, I read the codex every day. I don't necessarily react there. Uh, David is, 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 is uh, how shall I, more courageous than I am <laughs> and goes in there uh, from time to time. Uh, but there's a lot of good ideas there, actually. It's, there's a, and it's also a, 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 um, a forum where you, you get feedback on what you're doing. So without them like just saying, okay, well, uh, they're, let's put it this way. They're very, very critical, and critical is good. And because you can only get better because of criticism. There's this particular uh, couple of persons on that forum who hate our guts for some reason, and they, we, we learn a lot from, from their arguments, actually. All right, right well. So I'll do them the pleasure of mentioning them now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they all know. Yeah, I've always been curious what a designer must feel like reading some of that stuff. Well, when I was younger, it did a lot. It, it hurts sometimes. And criticism, well, criticism still hurts. I mean, it's, you put, you know, it's a very, um, how do you call that? 
you have to open up when you're doing this kind of stuff. You know, you you make yourself very vulnerable, and uh, we're like every single person in the world. We make many, many, many mistakes. I mean, even in our jobs, we make many mistakes. But I don't know anybody who does make mistakes. Unfortunately, uh, because we're doing something for the public, that means that everybody has the right to jump on us and like say, "Oh, you." idiots and uh, sometimes it's true sometimes we are idiotic and the one thing we try to be is like uh, accept it when somebody's right and then try to do better next time and that's all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that we'll be back here next week i will be at leocon the uh, texas a&m commerce and Commerce Texas is, uh, has invited me to do a workshop and a presentation on Matt Chat video games and YouTube. Uh, so if you guys happen to be in the area, uh, be sure to attend LeoCon. Uh, let's, if you see me, uh, be sure to introduce yourself. I'd like to, uh, to meet you guys and who knows, maybe even have some ales there in Commerce somewhere. Should be a great time, so look forward to seeing you. Uh, otherwise, I'll be back in two weeks. Now, if you would like to support the Kickstarter page uh, for Divinity Original Sin, just go to the show notes. I'll have links there to it. And if you'd like to support this show, just go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link, and make a donation or set up a subscription of any size. Uh, whatever works for you guys, I greatly appreciate it. Now, what about that Ale of the Week? Now, for the Ale of the Week, I've got a Sugar Shack Maple Stout. And this is brewed locally uh, to me here in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Actually, it's, uh, in, I guess, out of Collegeville, Minnesota, just a few miles up the road. And with special thanks to an actual abbey, uh, the St. John's Abbey up there. Uh, now, the monks, I I'm trying to figure out exactly what the monks have to do with this. They just say the monks have given the brewery exclusive rights to pair their notorious sweet blend with our perfectly crafted beer. Uh, so, I, I'm not sure exactly, I guess there's a little transfer of information going on there. But it doesn't seem that the monks themselves worked on it, but hopefully the 3rd Street guys were paying very close attention. I don't see any information here about the alcohol contents or anything. Uh, so, let's just get it open and see what it's all about. Alright, so I got some of this sugar shack here in the old drinking horn. I've been smelling this. It's very subtle. You get some sort of chocolatey, coffee-like notes there. Nothing's uh, really standing out, though. Um, my guess is this is going to taste <laughs> like a stout, which I suspect that it is. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Ah. Well, that is not bad. It's, you get a lot of uh, chocolatey taste, a lot of coffee taste. It's uh, lighter, though. Um, <clears throat> You know, what I'm really tasting here is like a peanut butter taste, like from those uh, peanut butter log candies. Um, not bad. Definitely don't taste a lot of alcohol or any uh, anything unusual or exotic here in the flavor. Now, let me try it one more time. There is a little hint of maybe like a milk taste in this. Um, but all in all, this tastes pretty much like a lot of other stouts I've tried. Not really uh, detecting anything here that really makes this stand out. Of course, it is cool that it's brewed here locally, so you know I'll give them a, a few points for that. Uh, but anyway, as far as the drinking horn goes, I'm going to go two out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely not bad, uh, but you know there's lots of <laughs> lots and lots of ales. Not enough time to drink them all, so if you really want a, a stout uh, or a maple stout, there's probably better selections there for you. Anyway, let's wrap up with a quotation. So I was looking for quotations on divinity and came across one from Mae West. And it goes something like this. To err is human, but it feels divine. See you guys next week.